Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Live from Las Vegas, it's time for you to be Talking Movies with America's most award-winning film critic, John Barber. You're being, John, you're being so gentle. I've heard you give reviews and you're so rough, you're saying. <laughs> How would you have evaluated your own work uh, in some of the films that you did prior to, uh, <laughs> prior to The Longest Shot? I mean, Much like... better than you, my friend. <laughs> Our next guest is one of those rare talents who has something to say and can say it funny. He's a writer-performer on the new Laugh-In and one of the most popular, outspoken, and entertaining personalities on the local news here in Los Angeles. He's won a half a dozen Emmys as a film critic and host of his own shows. Let's welcome Mr. John Barber, right over there. Hello again, I'm John Barber, and welcome again to Talking Movies, Show number 10. Doug, how are you today? And how's the new year going? I'm doing excellent. Thank you. And the new year has been so far spectacular. Well, it's about to get more spectacular with our amazing and wonderful uh, guests today. You know, show number one, we had Eddie Muller on, as you recall, and he's the wonderful host on Saturday night of Noir Alley on Turner Classic Movies, and he is the one man who single-handedly knows more about noir films than anyone in the world. But our guest today is the only person I know who seems to know more about every movie that ever, made, ever was made, who wrote them, who directed them. As a matter of fact, he did a couple on his own, and he's also lit written a library. Sorry about being tongue tied, but I'm so excited. And that's probably him on the phone. You are going to find out now why I'm such a massive fan. And you will be too. And so will everybody else. So, ladies and gentlemen, here's Joe McBride. Hi there. Happy New Year. And welcome to talking movies, and I must tell you, I am absolutely and honored to, and delighted and privileged to have someone who is by far one of the most qualified people on the continent to be talking movies with, and that is Joe McBride. Joe, welcome to the show. Happy, happy new year to you, and where are you? Great. Uh, I'm here and I'm in Berkeley, California. I think you and I crossed paths in Los Angeles when you were, uh, you and I were both reporters down there for quite a while. We did really? Then I, mean, I think so. We were at the same events, covering the same events and stuff, you know. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I never ran into you because I must tell you, I'm one of your very, very biggest fans because you are a one man Wikipedia of <laughs> wonderful work. Thank when you. it comes to films. And I must tell you that to me, the artists I admire the most above all else are the writers. Yeah, yeah. And my second favorite uh, American writer, my favorite of course is Mark Twain, but my second favorite American writer is Ben Hecht, by far probably the most prolific screenwriter in America based just on one book his autobiography, which is called The Child of the Century, mm -hmm. he started as a newspaper man. Yeah. For years, I was a very close friend of Richard Brooks, a oh. fabulous director and writer who also started as a newspaper man. Right. Now you started as a newspaper man, yeah. which makes me like you even more. Thank now you. listen to me. You have written 20 books. And you've written a half a dozen of them about some of the greatest directors or two on Orson Welles. And then you had Spielberg and then you have 
wonderful Capra book, very controversial. The guy that brought me to America with his movies and then John Ford and Howard Hawks, two magnificent books on the murder of John Kennedy. Thank you. And so I must tell you, it has been my experience from being around very successful, prolific writers that anybody who writes 20 books is either inspired by angels or driven by ghosts. <laughs> now, while I so much want to get into some of the stuff about Capra, and I have a great question when I ask you about one of Orson Welles' unmade movies, but you know, there could never be a movie about your life and your mm. magnificent work because we couldn't get it into three hours. <laughs> it would have to be a mini series, okay? <laughs> So you have this great buffet that you're going to give us today, which is only going to turn out to be a little bit of fabulous hors d'oeuvres. All of the books that you've done, I'm intensely interested in. But the one that I am most interested in, Joe, is the book about Joe McBride in Broken Places. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Because, Joe, that is a book with which that... I can identify with very, very deeply. So listen, mm. let's get to the beginning of your movie. Where were you born? What were your early ambitions and your early dreams? When did your life start to get broken? <laughs> and in the repairing of that really productive life, did early movies <clears throat> have anything to do with it? Well, so thank you, John, for the yeah. microphone and platform is yours. Well, you thank you for your about. kind comments. Uh, the Broken Places was a pet project of mine. It took 49 years to come to fruition. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's my story of my troubled youth. And I came from Milwaukee. And my parents were both newspaper reporters in Milwaukee. And uh, my dad was a um, TV and film critic for the Milwaukee Journal for a while, and the radio critic as well. And so I had passes for the downtown theaters. So I was going to movies all through my childhood and watching movies on TV. And it, it actually television kept me sane, I think during the fifties when I, I came from a very dysfunctional family. My parents were brilliant, but they're both alcoholics and, and we had seven kids. It was kind of a madhouse, but um, it, it was a you know struggle. And, and I, I went through the Catholic education system which was repressive and sometimes abusive. And um, I, um, I went to a very good high school, Marquette University High School, which is where Spencer Tracy and Pat O'Brien also went to school. And I remember in 1963, Pat O'Brien's autobiography came out and I discovered they had been to my high school. And I told one of the priests, I was all excited. And he said, oh, Spencer Tracy, he's shacked up with that Hepburn woman and he's, <laughs> and he's never given a penny to the school. He said, <laughs> I, was, I thought that's kind of the attitude they had toward Hollywood. Um, I really got a good education, but they were very repressive. And we had a school disciplinarian who would whip us with a golf club and things like that. And I was very um, hung up about sex as most young guys are, but I was you know, told by the church that it was terrible. I give Billy Wilder a lot of credit as my sex education teacher. I, I just, just published a long critical study of him. I love his work and his iconoclastic nature. And uh, Irma LaDuce was out at that time. And uh, it took me three viewings to get through it because the first time I walked out in the middle, I was scandalized by all the racy, scandally clad women. It was, you know, titillating, but it was, it's about prostitution in Paris. It's a very romantic film, but it's very risque. And the second time I made it almost all the way through until the um, Shirley MacLaine prostitute character is having a baby in church during her wedding. And I was scandalized again, I walked out. And then I went back a third time and I got through it. And I figured that was a big deal for me to, to get through that film. And um, soon but Joe, after- Joe, oh, hang yeah. on just a second. You just, you know, you came from, you say you came from a very, very dysfunctional family. That is one of the opening lines of my autobiography. And the line that I add is, I came from a very dysfunctional family hmm. long before it was popular. And then I go into detail as to why it was dysfunctional. So I was curious to see. You say your mother and father were bright, but they were drunks. Yeah. Okay. Give me some examples 
of how you had seven siblings. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Give me some examples about how their misbehavior or non-attention <clears throat> affected you and how you felt about that, how you felt about yourself and how you felt about them. Good question. Well, um, we all turned out well because they were, they made sure we got a good education. They were very, very strict in a way, but they would fight every night. You know, they'd come home from work and, and be uh, drinking. My mother was a newspaper reporter for the Milwaukee Journal when she, my father came back from the war and took his old job back and they made the women quit. If, if they married a guy who worked in the paper, the woman had to quit, which was a terrible sexist thing. So she was very unhappy all through the forties and fifties. And, and she drank a lot. So they had a lot of, they had fights every single night, which was very hard for kids. And we tried to drown it out with television, but it was traumatic because my mother would always threaten to get a divorce the next morning and we believed it and then it never happened. And then after a while, we began hoping that she would go through with it and she never did. But we had to put up with that constant uh, anxiety, which we all still. Were you close at all to any of your brothers or sisters and how did they respond? And have their lives been as successful and as creative and productive as yours. Yeah, we've all done well. My, I actually, uh, interesting thing, I have a brother named Pat, who's a doctor, very distinguished cardiologist. He just published his memoir. I said a trend, I guess. It's called The Luckiest Boy in the World. Oh, it's how a, wonderful. It's a wonderful book. He became a um, bat boy for visiting teams in Milwaukee for Major League Baseball. And then he became a ball boy for... Uh, clubhouse manager for the Milwaukee Bucks when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was there. And Pat got to know all the great players in the American League uh, and the National League too, you know, Henry Aaron, Ernie Banks, Ted Williams, he got to know, uh, Stan Musial, uh, Willie Mays. And then he was also working for the Green Bay Packers. So he, the players loved him and he did a wonderful job, but it got him out of the house and straightened out his life. And, and it's a very Capra-esque story because the players chipped in he said he wanted to be a veterinarian they said well you should be a medical doctor you know you're a smart guy so they actually chipped in and they helped my brother go to med, med school which is like a capper movie isn't it oh my gosh how terrific now in your case did the circumstances of your parents and your siblings sort of bring you to a typewriter or put a pencil and a piece of paper in your hand did you write yeah. much in school yeah, I was always writing from 1960. Uh, the first week I published my first article in 1960 in a national school magazine, Catholic school magazine. I got $40, which uh, was- What was the for, article about? Uh, it's about Warren Spahn, the great baseball pitcher, and oh. his son, Greg, was on my Little League baseball team. So my mother said, write a story about these two guys, and I did this. And Spahn was my athletic hero at the time. And uh, the same week, I got a letter from President Kennedy, uh, who is still senator. Actually, I've got it here because it's my most prized possession, thanking me for helping him in his Wisconsin primary campaign. Oh, my gosh. How wonderful. Oh, pres president. No, wonder, got... no wonder he spent 30 years <laughs> researching his, his murder. And you're yeah book is fabulous i mean it almost has the same title as my garrison documentary the american media and the second assassination of president john f kennedy but anyway the irony is that while you seem to have this dysfunctional parentage they were both newspaper people and you ended up becoming a newspaper person yeah, they were very uh, good. My mother taught me a lot about writing and my father took me along sometimes when he covered stories. And you know, every day at the table, we would talk about two things, either newspaper gossip, you know, local politics or um, world affairs, you know, so it was very stimulating. And uh, my mother encouraged me, but you know, one thing I did, and this is relating to your question, I had to shut out the noise from downstairs. So I spent in 1963, I went up to my room and closed the door and I didn't come out for three years, basically. And I wrote a book on baseball. I was a big baseball fan uh, going to Milwaukee Braves games during their heyday. And I wrote a book on baseball slang, which uh, I was really into words and etymology. And I, and I wanted to know the slang. And, and I, I went to the library and I couldn't find a book like that. And that's usually the reason I write books is that 
I want to read the book, you know, and there's no <laughs> such book. Uh, you, your documentary and mine do overlap a lot. We have a lot of, in common with this, that subject, the media. Uh, mine is called Political Truth, the Media and the Assassination of President Kennedy, and yours is very similar in its approach. When, when Joe, did you think you would want to leave Milwaukee and move to California? And for what purposes would you move to California? And what did your family think of it? Well, yeah, another good question. I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I was going to be a newspaper reporter and a novelist, like a lot of people were in those days. And then I saw Citizen Kane in 1966 in a class, and that changed my life. I, I then wanted to be a screenwriter and filmmaker. I was inspired by the fact that this young guy, Orson Welles, had made this film when he was 24, came from Wisconsin. And I spent eight years in Madison and I was writing a book on Wells, my first of three, actually. I haven't, my, my third book, Whatever Happened to Orson Wells, is just about to come out in a new edition. I updated it because his career keeps going on because he left behind so many unfinished works that people keep finishing. And uh, after eight years of, of writing, and I, I wrote a book on John Ford while I was in Madison, I went to California in 1970 to interview Ford, who was the most difficult guy just about in the industry to interview, except Jean-Luc Godard was actually the worst, but <laughs> Ford was near, nearly impossible. He was my first interview in Hollywood. And uh, I met Orson Welles, Jean Renoir, and uh, John Ford in one week, and Peter Bogdanovich, who was just a young starting filmmaker at the time. And, and I thought every week in Hollywood would be like this, you know. Uh, and by the end of the week, I was in a Wells film because Wells, I'd been sending him articles I was doing that were going to be in my book. And I had no idea if he was uh, reading them because he was always in Europe at the time. He didn't come back to America until 1970. He was in exile in Europe for political reasons for a long time. But he had been reading them and he, um, he, was, he liked them. And he didn't get a lot of attention at the time. He was kind of uh, ignored by the American media because he was uh, making you know, independent films in Europe. But he said, we're about to start shooting a film. Would you like to be in it? And I was really floored because I was not an actor. And I thought he was kidding. And I said, is this going to be a feature length film? It's all I could think of saying. And then he laughed and said, well, we certainly hope so. And, and uh, it turned out to be a kind of a good question, despite being a dumb question, because it took 48 years to become a feature length film. You, I, play, I, you played a critic, right? Yeah, I play a critic based on my young, uh, eager self uh, following John Houston around. He plays an old director making a comeback and that's now, tell, okay, yeah. now, you're a writer. How confident? Now, listen, you obviously don't have much of an income from your writing. Did you think you would, were you ever insecure about the fact that, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing this? Or I'm, as, uh, as Mark Twain said, I'm as confident as a Christian holding four aces <laughs> that, that I was meant to do this. When did you start to feel that you could really write and make a living doing it? Well, you know, oddly enough, when I sold that article for $40 in 1960 when I was 12 and I got the check, I still have the check, the check stub. Uh, I, I, I had a, an unlimited confidence just because of that. And I actually spent the next seven years trying to sell baseball articles to magazines and they all got rejected. And I didn't quit. You know, that's the key thing I tell my writing students. If you got it, you can't quit. I spent 10 years writing screenplays before I sold one. I taught myself how to write screenplays in Madison. And I wrote <clears throat> something like, oh, I don't know, five scripts before I wrote a good one. And I wrote a lot of short films. And then I moved to Hollywood to answer your question. In 1973, I, I, my goal was to go to Hollywood and be a screenwriter. And uh, I, I made a living. Um, it, it is very hard to make a living as a writer. And that's something I, I warn the students about. But, you know, Francis Coppola, when he came to our school, told the students the same thing I told the kids. You have to have a day job if you're working in the <laughs> film, film industry. You know, like if you go to Hollywood, get a day job. Like one of my good screenwriting students immediately got a job as a clerk in an insurance company. And he writes screenplays on the side, which is very what, what, what was it? Because I, you, I have a feeling you're going to remind me a little bit of, of Har Harlan Ellison. Did you <laughs> ever meet Harlan? Uh, yeah, I did actually a couple of times. He was a real character around Hollywood, wasn't he? He was such an uh, extroverted. Oh, elder. my gosh. Yeah. I loved Harlan. Harlan was going to do the introduction of my book, but sadly, 
He passed away, but when he started as a writer in college, his professor said, you're never going to be a writer, so get a day job. Oh, okay. Well, that's good, so, advice. good yeah, advice. So he started his first article. It was a crime story in one of these pulp things sold for $50. And every day of his life that Harlan sold something up until the time he started to sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, he would send a copy of that script to that professor. That's, wow. how, that's how vindictive he was. And, but anyway, and I booked him on every one of my shows, even though he bombed me as a talk show host, I booked him because he was so articulate about television. But he once said that he wanted a date with some movie actress who played a nun on television and, <laughs> and wrote a TV script just for her so he could get to meet her. And he wasn't that. proud of that. No. And, the, and I look at your first credit as a screenplay and it sounds like rock and roll high school or something. What well, is I had actually, you know, as I said, I wrote scripts for 10 years and then I sold three of them in short order. One of them was rock and roll high school, which is a it's become a cult classic. It's it's still playing. It played the other day at the New Beverly Cinema in L.A. Um, it's a beloved film by a lot of young people and rock fans. It stars the Ramones, who are wonderful, and they make the film a classic. It's the only story film they appeared in. They were in documentaries, but they're a wonderful punk rock band from the 70s. And um, it's it's a it's based on a. Um, strike my father ran when he was a high school student the kids went out on strike because they fired a, a woman teacher they loved and so i thought this would make a good story but then i thought let's have them blow up the school at the end because i thought my dad's story is a little mild for the 70s and i was inspired partly by um when i was a reporter in madison the students blew up a building to protest the vietnam war and killed a graduate student it helped end the anti-war movement it was very unfortunate but i thought let's have the kids blow up the school it's very anarchic it's it has 45 songs can you imagine two hundred eighty thousand dollar film with 45 songs today you couldn't do that at all and we even have a title song this original paul mccartney song that he let us use for five hundred dollars which was wow he wrote it for heaven heaven can wait the warren Beatty film and Beatty rejected it so uh mccartney let us use it on the proviso that we wouldn't use his name in the ad. So of course we use his name in the ads, <laughs> uh, but it's a fun movie. It's really well directed by Alan Arkish and it's a really charming film. But it's a lot of it is based on my repressive Catholic youth. And uh, you know, a lot of good people worked on the film. And, uh, but I'd written a film before that called Blood and Guts, which was about wrestling. I was always a sports fan. And I wrote some other Corman films. The things that I enjoyed the most as a screenwriter, I wrote five of the American Film Institute Life Achievement Award shows, which you probably yes. went, you probably went to them. Frank Capra, Jimmy Stewart, uh, John Huston, Lillian Gish, and um, uh, Fred Astaire. And I had the rare experience for a guy my age of working with these legendary figures and, you know, all their co-stars and directors. And, and it was part of my job was to rustle up the talent which was kind of interesting job because a lot of them didn't get along, you know, like I, I spent a month on the phone with Ginger Rogers trying to persuade her to come to the Fred Astaire tribute and she wouldn't come because I found out they really didn't get along very well. Uh, but I, that was my job is I thought this would make a good movie, you know, but I thought it's too much like the sunshine boys, you know, uh, <laughs> but well, we find she did say, she said, I do the same thing as Fred, only I can do it backwards. Yeah. Yeah. That was true. And uh, she, she, I mean, that was part of her gripe was she said, how come, you know, I called it the Esther Rogers films at one point. She said, you mean the, the Rogers Esther films, right? <laughs> but I got to work with all these great people and it was so much fun. And, uh, it was kind of film criticism for the masses on CBS. You know, they, after I left, the last show I did was Lillian Gish, which I, I, I love Lillian Gish. She was a wonderful silent movie actress, but CBS was horrified that we were spending an hour and a half of prime time honoring a silent movie star who was 90 years old. And it had the worst ratings of any AFI show in history, which I'm kind of proud of because uh, one of the trustees said, this finally proves the AFI has integrity that they honored her. And then from that point on, the show has been bouncing around all these different networks, you know. Uh, but it was, that's when I decided to retire from screenwriting. I got, um, 
an Emmy nomination for that show. I got a Writers Guild Award for the Houston show. I got a Writers Guild nomination for the Gish program. And I got vested for pension all at the same time. And I just figured, you know, I'm not enjoying being a screenwriter. They treat you badly as a screenwriter in Hollywood, as you probably know. Well, and you know, I'll tell you something that's very, very upsetting to me. And my first guest on this show was Eddie Muller. And I said, you know, will you correct this? I said, the reason, you know, if you look at Turner Classic movies, unless it's Shakespeare or Patty Shayevsky, you never know who writes the film. Oh, yeah, they don't and, talk about that. And the, and the directors, the director's guild is out of line. And the reason that you don't hear about directors, is, about writers is because of the power of the directors, because in the silence, they never needed writers. Well, they had writers, but they, you know, I mean, that's... They never credited them. Well, they, they credited them, but them. they didn't, they never publicized them was the problem, I think. You know, John, the, the directors, Frank Capra led the push to publicize directors. He was very good at self-publicity. I did two books on him. And he, he wrote an article in the 1939 New York Times. He said, the director has very little power in Hollywood. And he gets overlooked. Back then, they didn't have a contract yet. And, and then they had multiple people reshooting parts of films and the director didn't have cutting rights. But they, they very cleverly uh, got more power. It's partly because like in the theater, you know, the playwright is very powerful. They can't change his, his or her words without their approval. But in, in film, you're, as one of my screenwriter friends says, you're like a, carp uh, a carpenter who makes a, a chest of drawers. You sell it to them. They have complete rights. They can repaint it. They can cut the legs off. They can do whatever they want. And uh, that's been the history of film, unfortunately. And so they, Irving Thalberg had a famous line, the head of production at MGM, that the writer is the most important person in Hollywood and we must never let him find it out. <laughs> oh, that is wonderful. But Isn't you know, of, the, yeah. of all the director's books, I'm, um, I have some questions about Capra because of course, of course it was watching Capra movies that brought me to the, the United States. I wanted to come to that kind of Jimmy Stewart America. But the one that I'm most fascinated about, and I can't wait for your last book on Orson, Orson Welles is Orson Welles himself on two counts, Citizen Kane, an absolute masterpiece of a film from this young man with one of the greatest voices to ever be put in a human throat yeah. is Orson Welles. And then his second film, RKO destroyed his second film and it looked like there was a concerted effort to keep Orson Welles from making a movie. And I ran across a story that was attributed to you because of your absolute wonderful research on Orson Welles, that Orson Welles, now he was involved with a lot of unmade movies and half made movies, as you well point out. Mm -hmm. But is it true that he was going to make a movie about the murder of Robert Kennedy? Oh yeah. I, I, tell me about that. Who was going to play Sears Han, Sear Han, Yeah. and what happened? I read the script. I have two versions of the script. Donald Freed wrote the first draft. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Yeah. He's, written, he's written a lot of interesting conspiracy dramas. He's a playwright and screenwriter and novelist, and he wrote uh, Executive Action, for example. Yes. And he wrote a script called uh, Sir Han or is also called Assassin or The Safe House. It had different titles and they brought Wells in to rewrite it. He did a thorough rewrite. It's a very good script. It could be filmed uh, inexpensively. I showed it to a director, a friend, and he said, well, this is a great script that should be filmed. Um, it's all about the brainwashing of Sirhan, this young Palestinian guy. Uh, he gets picked up by the CIA for the MK Ultra program and, and Wells would have played the, the CIA um, psychologist who brainwashes him based on a real guy named William Bryan. Yeah. And um, there would have been a third character, a Palestinian woman who kind of seduces Sirhan. And Wells really believed it was, uh, Sirhan was a patsy. Sal Mineo was supposed to play the part. He probably would have been good. And oh, as you perfect. know, he, he got murdered too. And some people connect the fact that he was, well, he was planning to do the Sirhan film. But uh, as far as we know, it's one of those mysterious Hollywood murders. He was 
he was robbed in a parking lot where he lived, you know, in a parking structure underneath his building. And it, it may have been just a random coincidence, but it's a good film and it could be made. Wells wrote a lot of unproduced screenplays over the years, which I've read. And, uh, and whatever happened to Orson Wells, which is coming out, and I did a new epilogue about the other side of the wind, the film that I'm in, which is now finished and showing on net, Netflix. And a film that he, he made when he was only 23, before Citizen Kane, he made a film called Too Much Johnson, which wow. is a charming, silent uh, tribute to silent comedy with Joseph Cotton. And uh, it was lost for many years and it was miraculously found in a warehouse in Italy by a film buff. They were about to throw out the cans of this old nitrate film. I mean, it's amazing. And even Amberson's, the second film Wells directed in Hollywood, which I think is maybe the greatest film ever made, they, they slashed 50 minutes out of it and reshot parts but there's a guy named josh grossberg who's going to brazil he just got back and he's going again he's looking for the original print that wells took down their 131 minute version and he has some leads that's sort of the holy grail of film film buffs but stranger things have happened films have turned up in the strangest places but uh to to get into uh, wells is such a complex figure he did so many things in his life that the myth about him that I set out to correct in this third book was that he was inactive as the director for the last several years, as the New York Times said in their orbit of him. They had to run a correction because in the 15 years that I knew him at the end of his life, he was shooting film every day and he was constantly making films, but they often didn't get finished or shown because he was making them independently with his own money outside the system. And that's, you're not supposed to do that. And so Hollywood found him troubling you know he's that that troubles people uh, one, one wells critic said that was the true scandal of wells's career that he made films with his own money and you always hear people in hollywood <laughs> saying number one rule don't do that so it, it, it ran into problems for him but it wasn't because he was um uh slow or lazy or anything charlton heston said he was the most efficient director he ever worked with which i thought was a great compliment because heston worked with some of the best and the film i acted in I was spent five years acting in the film and I, I was a non-actor. So he molded my performance and I let him, I, I did whatever he told me. And I, I helped write my dialogue with him. He, he encouraged me to do that, but he was wonderful to work with. He was very fast. He worked 18 hour days. He was uh, indefatigable. He was very entertaining. The big myth about him, there are two big myths about him as a director. One is that he was an ogre on the set. Whenever you see him represented in a film or TV show, He's a glowering bully, you know, but he was really charming. He told stories, he told jokes, he sang songs, he entertained the actors. He said the actors are the most important thing in a film and, and everybody else is there to serve the actors. So the actors' lives should be made comfortable. And I think he was the best director of actors in film history and even got an okay performance out of me. He was always, always a joy on the Merv Griffin show. Yeah. Uh, I did the Merv Griffin show a lot back in, in the 60s and ran across him. What a joy. You know, and it, it, it really broke my heart that he, he put on too much weight. And then I realized when I saw Touch of Evil that he had to look yes. like that to play that magnificent character. I mean, he just, it was just an, in, it was literally a volcano of talent. Oh, he was just one of a kind. And, and, you know, it is true. There's a funny story about that film that when you see the pictures of him shooting on the set, he's, he's a hefty guy, but he's not as big as Hank Quinlan. But one day he, he had a party to celebrate his return to Hollywood and he invited all the studio heads who were friends of his. And he was going to show them a couple short films he had made and he was late shooting. And so he arrived back home. He hadn't had time to change out of his costume or makeup. And he, he looked like Hank Quinlan, you know, this grotesque uh, cop. And all the, all the, as he was running upstairs to change into his regular clothes, the studio chief said, Orson, Orson, you look wonderful. Great to see you again, you know. And so that was partly the inspiration for The Other Side of the Wind, which is about a Hollywood party where John Huston comes back to what's called the Easy Rider era now. And he meets all the, <laughs> all the young people in Hollywood and the party winds up with his death. It's a tremendous film. But... Um, the other misconception is that he was um, a wasteful director. He was not. He shot films very efficiently, very quickly. And uh, But the, the media in America spread these stories because they're threatened fundamentally, I think. I've thought about this a lot, by the fact that he was an independent maverick artist. And even the fact that he's fat, he got very heavy. 
and it did cause him some problems, but he kept working. Uh, and it wasn't because he was a glutton or anything. It was because of, you know, glandular things. But uh, a lot of Americans are overweight. And I was thinking about this last night. Why did they, you know, why do people make fun of him for his weight? Well, a lot of people feel defensive that they're a bit overweight. So they like to poke the finger at this guy who really is overweight. What is that great? Uh, it was a great, was it the Gala wine commercial that he did? He did the uh, Palmasone cheap wine commercials. They were cheap white wine. He did those for years. They were kind of laughable. And he, he saw it as a joke because he, he lost the job because he went on The Tonight Show and Johnny Carson said, do you really drink that stuff? And he, he well said, no, I never drink that stuff. So they fired him and they brought in John Gilgood, who's very skinny, you know, to, <laughs> to do the ads. But, he, you know, what people don't realize, he was making about 500000 a year. He was not destitute or anything, but he was pouring the money into his own productions. And he, he was very undiscriminating. He would do any commercial. He did like a Mexican cement commercial, his cameraman told me. And, you know, you give him $5,000, he'd spend a couple hours doing a voiceover for you. And he acted in a lot of bad films. He, he didn't, there were a few films he turned down, but he, he did anything just to make his own independent films without studio interference. Wait, uh, Joe, you mentioned uh, too much Johnson. Where could we see it and when can we see it? Well, you can see it online because the uh, Film Foundation, which is Martin Scorsese's preservation uh, uh, apparatus and the George Eastman House Museum restored the film with the help of an Italian archive. And they, they put the film online. It's an unfinished film that Wells partly edited. It's 66 minutes of uh, kind of strung together. It, it's not totally... Um, in sequence, sometimes you see repeated takes and all that, but that's very interesting. It's very beautifully shot. It's very funny and it shows a real keen knowledge of film. Wells didn't want people to know that he had experimented in film before he made Citizen Kane. He wanted you to think he was this wonderful cinematic virgin who just walked on the set. And, well, it is you know. true. You're a one man Wikipedia of wonderful <laughs> work with great, inform great information. Now I have a couple of other questions to ask you. And one is, did you ever see the documentary that won best film about seven years ago, six years ago, called Searching for Sugar Man? Yeah, that was wonderful, wasn't it? it to, me, to me, it is by far the best movie or documentary about anybody who was ever in show business. Okay, well, oh, I sure. say that about my autobiography, Your Mother's Not a Virgin, but the <laughs> kid who shot it from Europe I was talking about this the other day, shot it on his telephone. Oh, did he really? No kidding. Yeah, for the most part. Now, I listen to you tell, because I must tell you, I think the world, because you mentioned this thing about Orson Welles, the reason they hated him is because he was independent. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the two great lies that I've learned about the United States. <laughs> the first is freedom of press, yeah. which has been long gone since Clinton signed the Communications Act. When Kennedy was alive, as you know, uh, there were 1,500 owners of the media. Mm. And after the Communications Act in 96, signed by Clinton, it's now in the hands of six major corporations and, it, and either Trump or Biden or any president could take an executive order and reverse all that, but they don't do it. So we don't have a free press. And the other thing is that I used to dream about when I was a kid and watching these Capra movies and the Westerns and John Wayne is America was a country of independence. Yeah. They do not admire independence. No, it's corporate, corporate uh, you know, when the corporations took over Hollywood, which you probably remember because in the 70s, I was just reminiscing about those days. I was a reporter on Daily Variety, which I thought was kind of bad in the Wells film where my film school, because I didn't go to a film school, but you could go on sets of films as I'm sure you did. And you could, I could interview anybody I wanted just about. They're all in the phone book. You just pick up the phone and call Frank Capra or Howard Hawks and answer yes. the phone. And then I, they, the studios would say, you know, I'd say, can I go on the set of Hitchcock's family plan? They say, oh, sure, you know. And actually, my editor had to pull some strings to do that. But I went on the set of Bound for Glory and I went on the set of um, 
uh, Billy Wilder's the front page, for example. And, and But today you can't do that. The studios are so tightly controlled by corporate publicity. Th they're paranoid about any information coming out and they have it all carefully planned with in a corrupt way with uh, magazines. They'll, they'll promise the cover to some magazine. Well, Joe, the reason I brought that up about uh, searching for Sugar Man, I think because of what is happening to the disintegration of the United States, mm is that people, I think, would be more receptive to an honest-to-God interesting film about the murder of Robert Kennedy. I mean, it is so oh, obvious yeah. from, you know, I, along with, uh, uh, I became Thomas Noguchi's semi-savior for two years hmm. in the early 80s when both the uh, the press and the CIA and the LAPD wanted to get rid of him because he wouldn't alter the uh, conclusions he came to with his autopsy. And along with his attorney, we set up uh, a committee to retain Thomas Noguchi as the independent coroner of Los Angeles County. And of course, after two years, we lost that fight. And his hobby was painting uh, watercolors. And the only painting I have in my house is a thank you painting from Thomas Noguchi. And it is so obvious. You, you even watch the second gun. It is so obvious from the autopsy report, sir, hand six feet in front, and the fatal wound is two inches behind the ear fired upwards. It would seem to me with that Orson Welles script, oh, yeah. there would be just, you could literally shoot that on your phone or in any yeah. small camera, and even if it's just for your class, where yeah. you are probably the best film professor in the world, for God's sake, and how great to recruit your students hmm. and make this magnificent film unfinished by Orson Welles. Well, thank you. Well, the rights are complicated. That's one thing. There, Somebody wrote a long article about how complex the rights were and everything, but it is a it is a simple film to make because there are only basically three characters. There's also a secret service agent who's black who's uh, gets into the conspiracy. He, I mean, he begins to unravel it, and there's some footage, you know, documentary footage. But it is something that a good director and I, I've showed the script to a couple of directors who both agree this would be a terrific film to make. Um, you know, I actually when you mentioned Noguchi, who is a very honest coroner who got pilloried, and I, I actually proposed a documentary about him back in the 70s or 80s to some director who was asking me for ideas for a documentary and he kind of got nervous when I mentioned it but um, uh, you no know, Wells was uh, very skeptical and he was always outside the system and that's an example but that film should be made and maybe it will be made uh, Errol Morris made a film called Wormwood which is a good film about the MK yeah. Ultra program um, a lot of those records were destroyed as you know so he had to kind of reconstruct it but he had the son of one of the victims of MK Ultra, and he dramatized other incidents. But Wells's film is in that vein. It's a very, very thoughtful film, very interesting. I once talked to him about the Manson murders, and he said, uh, I said I was obsessed with the Manson murders. He said, I'm not obsessed with the Manson murders. And it turned out he was, actually. <laughs> but he said, the only thing that interests me about that is how this man got control of the minds of all those girls, which I thought was a very interesting Wellsian take because he was into powerful figures who controlled people's minds. Oh, my gosh. How interesting that you should bring that up because you'd be absolutely stunned that I got a most wonderful, wonderful letter uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a lady who wants to become a friend, uh, her name is Barbara Brussel, and she is the daughter of Mae Brussel. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you know who Mae Brussel is? Oh, sure. I talked to her. I did the last interview with her, actually. Oh, my gosh. Well, tell the audience a little about her, because I just want to tell you this quick story, yeah. but I want you to tell our audience a little bit more about her. Well, she was um, this wonderful woman who, who was the daughter of uh, Rabbi Magnin of Los Angeles, a very famous rabbi. And so she lived in uh, Northern California and she had a radio show uh, where she talked about conspiracies and she was a tremendous researcher. And she dug into all kinds of facets of uh, not just JFK's murder, but 
she was very interested in the well, Nazi, Nazi connections. And yeah, you know, was, to, to me, if you took all of the researchers and put them in one pile, they wouldn't come close to Mae Brussel. No, you know what people she, should look at is... She's the daughter of the founder of iMagnon, living yeah. in Beverly Hills with five kids. She sees Kennedy shot, and then a, a day later, she sees Oswald's shot, and she says, there's something fishy about this. And that started her on this mis uh, magnificent career. But the reason I heard from the daughter is because I've been trying to get Quentin Tarantino as a guest in the show mm. for two reasons. One of the reasons being, I think, Pulp Fiction and The Godfather are the Citizen Canes of gangster movies. Mm. But there's only one film in my life that I ever loathed. Mm. And I got to review it uh, 20 years after I stopped being a critic because I so loathed it. And that was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, yeah, I hated that film. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. You, if you go to YouTube, somebody found, a, 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 I had a, a guy who was my webmaster who went down the Trump rabbit hole. And because I made jokes about Trump, I wrote the best. I had this when, you know, the United States since the United 2000 or since 1917 has been trying to trash the Soviet Union. Mm. And about four or five years ago, they started trashing Putin again. They just started trashing the Soviet Union. So I wrote this joke that we now have proof that Putin is a liar. <laughs> he called Trump a genius. So, <laughs> Well, anyway, my yeah. webmaster destroyed 45 years of my work, including oh. that review, the only review left of me on camera, and a lady found it. You go to that and you will understand why, because May Brussel, if you Google YouTube and just mm -hmm. Google uh, Charlie Manson is Patsy, right. it'll literally blow your mind away because when it happened when I was in LA, I said to my wife, now I'm not, I don't know anything about these things, you know, I'm dying to get a talk show and I'm dying to be successful and all this is just distracting news to me. But I said to my wife, hey, honey, let me tell you something, 20 year old kids smoking dope do not climb telephone poles mm. to cut wires. Yeah. I well, said, I was going to say the same thing, you know, John, uh, when you mentioned May Brussel, it, it, I flashed to her Peace on Manson, which is a brilliant broadcast. You can find that online. Oh, thinks, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, oh, she my thinks God. Uh, Manson was controlled by Army intelligence. Tex Watson, who actually did the murders, is Army intelligence. He's still alive. Manson was kind of a patsy. He was um, part of, probably part of the MK Ultra program. There's a good book called Chaos recently that goes yes. into more on that. Uh, we don't know the whole story, but it's, a, it's an interesting story. But um, May, I interviewed her. I, I did research on George H.W. Bush. I was the one who found out that he was in the CIA long before he admitted it. And I also found out his connections to the JFK assassination. And I wrote about them in 1988 for The Nation. And I did two articles and then they wouldn't run the third article, which I wrote, which was very well documented. But in the course of that, I called May Russell and uh, she, I didn't realize she was literally dying. And this woman answered the phone and said, she's very ill, but she wants to talk to us. So she came out of her deathbed and we had a great talk. And she said, I, I've been wanting to write a book called Killer Bush. And she, oh. told me, she told me all kinds of stuff about George Bush. I, I did a lot of research into the Bush family. And as my son said, I predicted everything that happened in, in recent years. I didn't quite predict 9-11, but I knew that once, uh, George W. Bush stole the election. We'd have wars and all kinds of terrible things. But um, I, I've, May Brussel told me all kinds of things about Bush that later have been, you know, proven, uh, like the Cuban airliner that they blew up when he was yeah. the head of the CIA and things like that. Uh, Russ Baker did a good book on the Bush family, but there's still a lot about the, the Bushes that is still, uh, you know, they've buried a lot of this very deeply because they're they're spooks, you know, and they're. They're very good at hiding their history, but the mainstream media don't have a clue. You read mainstream books on the Bush family and, and they don't have any of this in there. But um, I, I did a lot of research on Bush and in, in my book, Into the Nightmare and the Kennedy Assassination, I have 35 pages on Bush and his right wing Texas associates. Uh, for example, the article, The Nation Wouldn't Run, 
uh, he had a guy named James Parrott working for him in his yeah. organization in Houston, who was a crazy right wing nut young guy. And he called the Bush called the FBI in the afternoon of his assassination and said Parrott has been threatening to kill the president when he comes to Dallas. And you would think, first of all, why didn't he call the Secret Service before Kennedy was shot instead of waiting for Kennedy to be shot, right? So I did some research into Parrott and why would Bush make this phone call? Bush had been in Dallas on the 21st and 22nd. Russ Baker helped prove that. But um, I found a lot of, uh, the FBI did an eight month investigation of Parrott and his right wing friends in Dallas and Houston who were Nazis and, and uh, dangerous characters. One of them threatened at length to kill Robert Kennedy. And uh, this was all covered up, but I got the story and then the nation got nervous and wouldn't run the story. So, um, but I, that that's part, part of my long research on Kennedy and all the, you know, the right wing uh, forces arrayed against him. You know, it's have, have you ever met an investigative reporter or talked to an investigative reporter named Wayne Madsen? I know who he is. Um, he was in that film on Bush that yes. Alexander Pelosi made. He seemed very sharp guy, didn't he? Uh, uh, he's unbelievable. He's a very, very, very close friend. And I'm going to send you his email so you can be in okay. touch with him because, you know, he was, he and two others were called by John Kennedy Jr. about eight weeks before John Kennedy was Jr. was murdered in his plane. A lot of people thought that uh, John Kennedy Jr.'s magazine was George was named after George Washington. It was not. It was named after the man that he thought murdered his father, George Bush. And he engaged uh, Wayne and two other young, really good investigative, proven investigative reporters to come aboard because he wanted to change the tenor of the magazine from fluff to so mm -hmm. that it would be more like Rolling Stone or Ramparts and a little more credible because he wanted to run for the Senate. Mm -hmm. And you know, if that happened, he could become president and everything would open up, which of course didn't last. Anyway, shortly thereafter, after Wayne, oh my God, he was so excited about doing it. It just said the guy uh, was unbelievable. Well, Wayne was one of those rare, honest reporters in the mainstream media. My new book, Political Truth, the Media and the Assassination of President Kennedy, is an account. I've been researching this since, you know, 1980s about how the media have lied to us since 1963, the mainstream media, you know, mainly New York Times, Washington Post, CBS, and then everybody else too. But there are occasionally uh, uh, honest reporters who try to break through the noise, but they, they, they settled on this lone assassin implausible story the first weekend and they've been sticking to it ever since. And it takes independent researchers like us and, and a lot of other people. Uh, and we don't get paid much for it, but you know, we do it out of love of Kennedy and and love of the truth, and we we we've come up with a lot of contrary information, and and but what, part of the point of my book is that I think that the division we have in our country now, which is so serious, we have half the country believing the truth and half believing a lot of nonsense, is uh, people say that started with the Vietnam War when we were lied to, but I really think it started with the Kennedy assassination because from the first week. The American public didn't buy the lone assassin story. They were too smart, you know, but they were misinformed and the Warren Commission came along and confused the public. And But over the years, 60, 70, 80 percent of the public has, has believed uh, in a conspiracy. But you won't find that in The Washington Post and New York Times. They're willing to admit, finally, that Trump tried to pull off a coup. But even that at first. I go into that a lot in my book, because I think that's the ultimate end result of what happened to Kennedy. Once you blow the president's brains out on a public street and nobody is punished for it. The government did it to Kennedy. Uh, anything can happen. I mean, you know, I, I'm not surprised by fake wars and, and all kinds of things. One thing I point out in the book is every major event in, since 1960 in America, um, Watergate, Iran-Contra, uh 9 11 etc the official stories don't make any sense you know but people well, jimmy it. jimmy carter in a documentary says and bless his heart for it uh he said america can never be the same unless we get to the bottom of the john kennedy murder and he tried to yeah. appoint ed Sorensen 
a Kennedy man, there was not one Kennedy man on the Warren Commission, tried to get him appointed head of the CIA to do that. And he was shot down by the military that appointed an admiral as the head of the CIA. But you know, tomorrow is going to be January 6th. Yeah. And I must tell you, being a writer and admiring writers, especially the geniuses, you know what I think of when I think tomorrow being January 6th? Hmm. What do you think? I think of William Shakespeare and Hamlet. And in that magnificent soliloquy with the five greatest, shortest words in history, to be or not to be, Hamlet is thinking of killing himself because of the law's delay. Hmm. Here we are now a year afterwards, and yeah. every single attorney worth his salt has said from the videos we've seen of January 6th of Donald Trump telling them to go fight for their rights and yeah. fight like hell, you could arrest the man now, drag him into court and have a trial instead of going through all this nonsense about filing charges of contempt of Congress. And you know what? It'll probably be another year and nothing will happen. Well, what happens in America, as you know, and you and I reached the same conclusion in your documentary in my book, that if we just start facing the truth, that's the first step toward climbing out of our, our morass and corruption and confusion. Yes, but, but, is, but, you know, the bigger the crime, the more you get away with it in America. You know, the people, the little people who storm the Capitol who are culpable are getting put in jail, but the guys who planned it are not, you know. Well, the thing is, nothing can happen without it being known popularly by the public through the media. Yeah, and the media That's have been why... lying about this too. And I, I go into that how, for example, they didn't want to use the word coup. And I go into a lot of how Orwell talked about how the language is debased yes. by lying. He wrote that famous essay, Politics in the English Language. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how if you want to start a totalitarian country, the first thing you do is create a lot of lies. And Trump is a master of that. And uh, so even the Washington Post put out a video, for example, soon after the event saying it wasn't a coup and here are the reasons, a lot of bullshit. But then recently when General Milley started saying more or less it was a coup, even though he didn't use those words, a couple of books came out and suddenly the press started saying, I was watching CNN last night, they were calling it a coup attempt. You know, it was so obvious to the average person it was a coup attempt. But they called it a riot, which is sort of like I was waiting for them to say it was a tailgate party that got out of hand. You know, yeah. uh, they called it an insurrection, which is a little better, but it was a coup attempt. And it was not only on one day, but it was over a period of a couple of months. And, you know, it was a failed coup. But, they, you know, and when I worry about this and we all do that in 2024, it could happen again. And but it's, it happened in 1963. And that's why I wrote Political Truth, because. I wanted to study how the media create a lie and then why do people go along with it? And uh, we're very dominated by the mainstream media and it takes a lot of um, well, you, that's guts. What, you have to be the critical point, the of the media. The point is this, you know, I, th I made a mistake because ever since I became Garrison's Boswell, I was saying, hey, the House Select Committee turned the findings over to the Justice Department saying, Oswald may have been involved with it, but there was a conspiracy, both in the murder of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. So I've been urging everyone. I mean, at the end of my film, I take a 10 most wanted list to the Justice Department. That is yeah. the mistake. So two weeks ago, I went on the air and I was haranguing Oliver Stone and Dr. Cyril Wept, the only two people since we live in a popular culture world that the people would follow. If they want to do anything, forget about the Justice Department. Right, right, right. Because you can safely march on the White House and say, please sign an executive order and give us back a free press. Now, in a free press, we will get a lot of lunatics. But yeah. on the other hand, we will get a lot of great journalists and people like yourself who can begin to report stories and the facts about the murders, the political murders in this country, whether that will happen or not, I don't know. I don't well, have I'll give you an idea that, you know, 
it's fashionable in the mainstream media to denigrate the internet because they say it's unmediated, but I think that's what's good about it. And as you say, you get a lot of nuts and a lot of disinformation, but Darnella Frazier, the young woman who took the video of George Floyd's murder and she kept the camera steady, what did she do? She put it immediately on YouTube without selling it to, the, to Time Life, like Zapruder sold his film to wow. Time Life. And they gave it to the CIA. The CIA tampered with the film and the public didn't see it for 12 years. But Darnella Frazier just uploaded it for free. She was a public, you know, a good citizen. And she got a Pulitzer Prize citation. That's what's good about the internet is that a person like that, a citizen journalist, can, can report the truth and look at the impact that George Floyd murder has had on our country. So there are people like that. And I, I have uh, hope for the media if we, if we don't censor the internet too much. I, I get nervous when they start censoring the internet. Um, and I'm going to teach a course on Fahrenheit 451 in the spring. Because oh, that's how fabulous. Well, I get inspired, I must tell you. Just talking to people like you and reading all of your stuff, I mean, it just... It's so thrilling and it's so encouraging. Now, I'm going to get one, back to one last question, yeah. which I thought was really funny in your part. It said you took 49 years or something <laughs> to adjust to the realities of sex. Yeah. And you thank Billy Wilder as your Dr. <laughs> Ruth or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I must tell you, Billy Wilder wrote and shot some fabulous, fabulous film. I just love The Apartment. Oh, yeah. He told me, you know, I gave him the LA Film Critics Career Achievement Award uh, in 1995, and I had lunch with him and Jack Lemmon. And while we were waiting to go on, I said, what do you think is your best film? And he said, The Apartment. And I, I said, why? And he said, because it's my best mixture of comedy and drama. And that's what I was working for all my life. It's a seamless, beautiful comedy drama he said in, in an interview once he never saw it as a comedy it's really a serious film but it has a lot of great mixture you know like real life ridiculous things happen to us when serious things are happening at the same time and, and that film really captures that like when jack lemon brings the pickup from the bar to his apartment and they're drunk and then he finds this uh, shirley mclean is overdosed in his apartment and it's this pivot from comedy to tragedy you know oh, it's it, great it's with the doctor great. living next door yeah i just did an audio commentary in the apartment and i did an audio commentary on some like it hot which is another one of my very favorite films and that had a huge impact on me when i was 12 can you imagine a 12 year old catholic kid somehow getting into that <laughs> and it opened up these vistas for me of what are these guys doing running around dressed as women learning to me it's a very feminist film and, and my wife who's a psychologist ran into billy wilder with me and she said you know thank you for making a feminist film and he said what and she said well you know it's it's a film about what it's like for men to walk around in women's shoes literally <laughs> and, and he said well I, you know i don't hear that very often but thank you you know and, and it really is a feminist film and uh, also hey, Marilyn Monroe. Joe, was, tell, Joe, tell us yeah. who your wife is. Uh, Dr. Ruth O'Hara from Stanford University. She's a dean at Stanford. And uh, she's a great film expert. And uh, she, she loved going to Hollywood events with me because she's a film maven like us. And, and, and has she, she written books? She's, she's written a couple of books on psychology. She's an expert on aging, Alzheimer's disease, and, and uh, the aging process. She's internationally respected. She's the dean of research at Stanford right now. Oh, well, that is absolutely wonderful. And you have been an absolute treat. And as I said at the beginning, that this is just hors d'oeuvres. I yes, mean, thank you, John. you just have a buffet of brilliant yeah. stuff to talk about. I have only just begun. We didn't even get close to Frank Capra or Howard Hawks or John Ford. And maybe I'll say this in closing, that great line at the end of Casablanca. Claude Rains, what does Claude Rains say to Humphrey Bogart? Um, Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Well, Joe, I think yeah. this is the beginning yeah. of a beautiful friendship. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. The best to your wife and your students. And we will see you again later and have a happy new year. Thank you, you too. And I'd love to see you again. And it's been great fun. Thank you very much for, uh, thank you for bringing up the broken places. Not too many people do. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you later. Bye-bye.